Hello, I'm Michael, and today I'm going to share with you the art of software. When we think of software, we often think about codes and straight lines, but there's more to software than codes and straight lines. There is the art of the algorithm, the art of the structure. And structures can be curved, they can be organic, and structures can evolve to represent who we are. Programs ultimately are a reflection of the programmers or programmer that put them together, that piece them together. And so it is with the art of algorithms and data structures that the empirical method of defining the code so that it goes from one state to another Yes, there are scientific and mathematical principles that can apply. But you can bring your mind to a different level when building programs such that you find the actual rhythm of the process to build what needs to be built. To see what needs to be seen. Many have seen this particular uh, document before because it's been in at least uh, one or two of my previous videos. And it's the World Population Data Sheet. It's a PDF that I downloaded from the internet and it was part of my exercise. And the exercise was to basically uh, take a table of information and import it into a database, an SQL database. In this case, Microsoft SQL Server. Even though I'm now doing this on Linux, right? So I have this PDF that has this table of information. So the concept was very straightforward to me, right? What you could do is you could, you could uh, take information like this right and you know let's just say you copied it you could press copy and you could paste it into a text editor and then manipulate it from there but I wasn't about to do that because I'm practiced in software development and we like to do things in a much more streamlined and automated fashion and that include, in, the, in this case, that included using a tool like XPDF Utils PDF to Text program. And what that program uh, does is it can take a PDF file and convert it to text. And you could pass in flags to it where it will convert it in specific ways. And I used a flag that would take the uh, table data that you see here on the screen that's encoded in the PDF and convert it to its text equivalent. What I didn't expect was that the conversion would result in spaces between each column. Spaces. And the problem with spaces is that they can be very uneven. So, for example, there may be eight spaces between this column, there may be 10 spaces between this column, maybe eight here, and maybe 12. So the spaces can vary to such an extent that writing the codes to adapt to that can be a little more complicated than necessary. So one way to address that is to convert those uneven spaces into either a single space or preferentially a tab. A tab is preferred because it's a single character that's distinct 
from the normal text. Most text that you're going to parse and import into a database is not going to have a tab or a pipe delimiter. So I prefer tabs, others prefer pipes, right? Tomato, tomato, you can go either way with it. So I went with tabs and I like tabs because they're, they're not visible. You can't accidentally include them in the text in a way that you know creates problems in other processing software. So, and they're easy, they're easy, very easy to detect. So that's why I went with, with tabs, and that was the exercise in this particular frame. Recently, I wrote an article about this experience of transforming the data and working with the large language model, AI in this case, to understand what was going on with the, the, the transformation process. And you know, I write these articles just to have documentation so that in years to come, I can look back and understand my actual process and my evolution. And so I have reference to the different videos that um, I did on the topic and I was able to reach a point where I looked at the different steps that I took to um, arrive at the approach that um, I settled on to transform this data from text um, from spaces to tabs. And so part of this process was to um, reach a conclusion on large language models when it came to expert code, more important code and code that had to be accurate and reliable. And so as others know who have looked at the previous videos, I basically went through an exercise with ChatGPT where I would basically give it a description of what I'm trying to do and see what it would be able to put together. And what I saw in all cases was that, you know, whether I used a simple description or I used a more elaborate, extensive description, the results were the same. And I was a little baffled by that at first. But then, you know, I remembered, you know, what I've read and understood about how large language models are implemented. And I decided to uh, try that at least three different times where I would see if it could generate code better than what I've written because I wrote my actual solution independent of AI in a large language model because I saw that what I could write is better than what it could come up with. And prior to my use of AI in this case, I had already designed it on paper. So maybe I was biased. Maybe I was just a little biased in that I um, already had a solution that was in my mind that I knew was, was the right way to go. Did I collapse the quantum wave function in that case? Um, who knows? But I basically uh, took um, I took that uh, process of discovery through a large language model, and I decided instead of trying to generate a better code through it, why don't I just um, figure out what it thinks of the code that I've written, and maybe that's a different way to go through and uh, understand. Um, how it works and how it could develop uh, better codes. And what I came up with is that it identified my algorithm as a finite state machine, that my programming approach is primarily uh, focused on that. But the thing about that is, is that um, uh, I'm pleased with that. And I agree with that because that has been what I've been planning to do as far as developing 
uh, my own um, personal programming approach. And my earlier videos um, explain that a, a little bit better than I'm doing right now. So, because what, what I want to talk about is not so much that, but I want to talk about the conclusion that was reached with uh, this process. And basically, <clears throat> I wanted to see if ChatGPT could identify the algorithms that it was presenting to me and see what it came up with. And so I took the three best codes that ChatGPT came up with and I, I represented it to ChatGPT to see what it would come up with as far as the type of algorithms that it's suggesting. And in every case, it um, identified this space um, to tabs uh, process as a greedy algorithm, right? It's an actual type of algorithm called the greedy algorithm that um, like many algorithms, not all, but many algorithms, breaks a problem, a larger problem down into sub problems. And uh, in this case, does it without backtracking, right? And there's a little dash of state machine thrown in there for good measure. But I think that's par for the course with many algorithms. It's just a question of how dominant is the finite state machine or state uh, tracking aspect of an algorithm. So these are the three algorithms that it, it um, presented going from, you know, I would say uh, average to best. And then I decided, you know, in addition to identifying the algorithms in the code, what if we could compare these different codes uh, to each other? And so that's what it set out to do here. And it basically said that the first implementation that it rep that it uh, presented was clear but less efficient. And don't worry if I'm not actually showing these because I'm going to uh, put the actual implementations in the description. And you can also see the article that I wrote uh, on my blog um, for a little bit more context. But um, it said the first implementation, the one that it recommended, was clear but less efficient due to nested loops. And nested loops don't always result in less efficiency. So we shouldn't um, draw that conclusion. But if you don't handle nested loops correctly, then you can throw off cache locality and you can have a less efficient process. The second implementation, this is the implementation that uh, ChatGPT uh, has identified as the best of what it has presented. It's clear and efficient and it correctly handles space sequences. The third implementation is clear and efficient, but lacks handling of single spaces within words. And the fourth implementation, which is mine, which was written by hand, designed on paper without the use of AI, is correct and efficient, but complex and harder to read. And I used to see harder to read as a detractor, but I no longer uh, view it that way because an expert implementation should not be sacrificed on the altar of readability and aesthetics. So anyway, I actually tested out both implementations, the second and the fourth, and I did it in the same program so that there wouldn't be anything <clears throat> to throw it off, right? Because I have a program I wrote that is much more intricate, but I decided to just make a quick test program in Linux um, using C Sharp and .NET on the command line and I generated the output files, second implementation output and fourth implementation output. I had ChatGPT uh, evaluate the input against the outputs generated by <coughs> the second implementation and the fourth implementations. And what it uh, was able to uh, identify was that the second, second implementation got it wrong. Whereas the fourth implementation handled it um, perfect. 
So what this means is it doesn't matter how aesthetically formed a code is and how popular the code is because AI generates these codes based off of the most popular uh, instances of a particular statement, data, or piece of information. Popularity, popularity rules in the world of the large chatbot large language models. But popularity does not equate to accuracy, reliability, and durability. It doesn't represent the highest quality or production grade. And so I didn't expect this conclusion, but I'm not surprised by this conclusion. What is programming? What is software development? To me, programming is transforming data from one state to another. Sometimes it's transforming code from one state to another. I liken it to input, processing, and output. Those are three terms I've always used with my trainees, with my interns, with those that I introduce the art of programming to. So in the art of software, you have an end state in mind, not necessarily a beginning state, but you have an end state. You have the outcome you are attempting to produce. And in some minds, this end goal can be very vivid, can be very detailed, colorful, intricate, full of depth and substance, albeit a living entity in its own right, existing within your mind and your consciousness. And you are channeling all the aspects of yourself to bring about and manifest this end state. And the end state itself, when it manifests onto a computer and it shows up on a screen or in other forms, this end state is in itself fluid and dynamic. So in state is not even a clear representation of this particular outcome because this outcome has a fluidity and a dynamism to it that doesn't exist in a physically built material. Let's say a table. A table is a table, but a program is more than what a table can represent. A program can express dynamic change as one interacts with it. And the ability and consciousness to foster that and bring that into being is a very welcome and thrilling experience. So what we see in our mind's eye, deep within the corners of our mind that can become a actual somewhat tangible reality is a huge driver of the software process. So then, we now need to bring into the right circumstance the starting state, the beginning state, the begin state. We have to know where we're going. So we need to look at our input and how that input will ultimately relate to the output, the ultimate output. And so there is always a relationship between the input and the output. And we harness all the 
skills, insights, and knowledge that we have in order to make that transition useful, to make that transition from the beginning state to the end state possible. And we do that right in the middle through processing. And processing is quintessentially programming. What are the processes and the steps we put in place, the movements from one set of codes to another and the data that weaves in between them? Because that data is the fuel of the program that is the actual seed that blossoms into the actual program that we're trying to produce overall. So it tends to be less about algorithms and data structures, but more about data structures conveyed by algorithms. And so as we peer into the universe of possibilities within ourselves, we're able to look at the geometry of design, geometria as one aspect, sacred geometry as another aspect, the order of elements and the hierarchies that arise as we bring different elements together to manifest the program. And so that's the actual energy we see in our mind when we dream about code, when we sleep and rest and it processes through our subconscious, when we take paper and we sketch out code or representations such as user interfaces, file structures, or the blueprint from a bottom-up architecture comprising relational databases and no SQL databases, middleware and services, and optionally front ends. So that is the process of building, the process of summoning the right codes and the right outcome. This is the data, by the way, this is the data that PDF to text converted from a PDF to text format. And as you can see that you got data on different, it appears to be on different lines, but I, that's text wrapping. Uh, that's the text wrapping preference in my text editor. But anyway, so you got these different spaces, right? And so what we want to do is we want to convert it from this to this, where you have tabs between each column, right? And this is the output that ChatGPT's second implementation generated. And we don't want the tabs in the front like this, right? You know, so, you know, this could throw off data import. You know, you'd have to write some codes to try to account for that or mitigate that, and it's quite unnecessary. And so this is my implementation which doesn't even look for beginning tabs or, or, or beginning spaces or ending spaces or anything like that. It wasn't even designed to do that. It was designed to identify the words and put tabs between them. <clears throat> and it does it so well that it automatically does it the right way. And so that's the implementation of a good algorithm where you're not searching for an algorithm that um, meets the tastes of others, right? Where you could say, oh, look, it's this algorithm. It's that or this or that. But it's more like this is the correct way to implement it. And we don't need to try to uh, conform um, our implementation to a established standard, right? Even though that's not necessarily a bad thing. But in this case, you know, it's good that there is an implementation that encompasses many conditions and scenarios. 
and this is um, the difference between, um, in this particular case, recommendations that are drawn from what is popular versus recommendations from within ourselves that um, does the right thing in the best way. So this is um, some of the example code that I was uh, referring to, <clears throat> right? And I posted it to the gists uh, part of my profile rather than complete projects in GitHub. These are just uh, snippets of the codes. So this is the first implementation that ChatGPT presented. And it's actually really good. I actually like it. And I generally write code this way. Um, in general, this is how I write um, the majority of the software that I write. So um, ChatGPT was on the right track in terms of what it was recommending to me and what it recommends to the majority of software developers. This is the second implementation that it recommended. Um, I used to write code like this. And on occasion, um, I might write it like this. But... <clears throat> Generally, I avoid writing code this way um, because it's um, it, it's actually more prone to error with the different branches that it's doing. Um, sometimes you have no choice but to do it this way. But if you work hard at it, you can actually collapse this into something that is much more compact. Um, this code here that was the third implementation or third typical implementation that ChatGPT would recommend is um, more in line with what you would see in algorithms textbooks, what you would see as far as um, what is docu what are documented algorithms in research papers, um, case studies, white papers, that sort of thing. Um, colleges, universities, professors, uh, research scientists, this is the type of codes that they would normally generate. But... Um, <clears throat> I don't like that uh, type because it's um, it's too symbolic. And this is basically the same style, but with my touch, you know, it's a, it's a fusion of making code more readable in terms of intent baked into the way the code is defined without having to rely heavily on comments. And at the same time, um, in this case, it's very, very... Um, streamlined. So a single pass to go through uh, the line is what I would prefer, although there's nothing wrong with multiple passes. Because in the actual program that I wrote, this is this whole thing is one pass, and then there's a second pass that actually cleans up the tabified result, and then a third pass after that, that then puts it into a final state that is then imported into a database. But Breaking up that way is cleaner. And, of course, there's quite a few books on algorithms out there. Um, I'm wrapping up uh, this one here. Um, this is just something that I read on my uh, off time or on my work breaks or whatever, just to keep my mind moving in the right direction on a variety of topics. And, um, you know, most of the code examples are written in C++, which is um, cool in my my opinion, because we had too many years of code written in example code written in Java. So, and there's nothing wrong with Java, but um, and greedy uh, algorithms. Um, I noticed that I highlighted earlier. I, did, I didn't even remember that I highlighted this, but there will always be a best technique, according to the author of this book, Andy Vickler. And so, um, I think. Greedy algorithm is misnamed. It should be called optimal algorithm. But um, as the name indicates, it's the best choice. It is. It makes its choice based on what appears to be the best one at the time. There will always be a logically optimal choice. And um, you're striving for a globally optimal solution. And so, you know, you know, in this case, they go through what a typical greedy algorithm looks like, right? And so... Even though I'd read this a few weeks ago, right, it's um, it was probably just circulating in my subconscious by the time I decided to um, write a program 
that solved a particular problem for me. As we peer into the face of the eternal goddess and we understand what the possibilities are for creation from the primordial essence of our consciousness and our innermost being as a reflection of the greater primordial consciousness and innermost being. We see many possibilities for what we may produce in concert with our will and intent, skill, and time and motive to build to the furthest level that we can. What we see is that what we want to produce and what we want to manifest is completely possible with the right time, resources, and motivation. What we also see is that going from start to finish is not necessarily a matter of can it be done? Because in the realm of this medium we call computers and software, data, and code, everything is possible given the right mind of the programmer. Again, the programs are a reflection, a drop into the ocean or the lake or the river or even a glass of water. It's just a drop and it ripples out and a greater creation begins. What this overall discussion was is a small example, the smallest example with substance that express what this process looks like, not just from the standpoint of generative AI and large language models, but the broader picture that there is more within the being that we call human. There is more in the being that we call human that brings about transformation. And what generative AI assists us with is this transformation process in its individual steps, but that the design of those things that resonate with other humans and resonate with us, that process resides with us. It resides with the master architect.